Hello and welcome to today's webinar on searching in the 1950 census. My name is Ginevra Morse. I'm the Vice President of Education and Programming here at American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be moderating today's event. American Ancestors is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history research and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. This program today is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. Our presenter is Lindsay Fulton, a nationally recognized professional genealogist and lecturer who joined American Ancestors NEHGS in 2012. First as a researcher and then as a genealogist, now she leads the research, uh, research and library services team as its vice president. In addition to helping constituents with their research, Lindsay has also authored a portable genealogist on the topics of applying to lineage societies, the United States federal census 1790 to 1840, and the United States federal census 1850 to 1940. She is a frequent contributor to the NEHGS blog Vita Brevis and was featured in the Emmy winning program Finding Your Roots, The Seedlings, a web series inspired by the popular PBS series Finding Your Roots with Henry Louis Gates Jr. Her areas of expertise include state and federal censuses, New England, Ireland, and New York research with a focus on lineage society applications. So Lindsay will provide some general background on the US federal census and then turn to the recently released 1950 US federal census, how to find your family and how it can be used as a springboard to other records and research. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your question in the panel at the bottom of your screen and we'll address those at the end. There is no handout for this presentation, but we are recording this event and starting tomorrow, you can easily go back and review any of the content Content from the presentation on our website as well as our YouTube channel. So if you miss something on today's first listen, not to worry, you can always go back and review the presentation later. All right, so without further ado, I will turn things over to Lindsay. Thank you, Ginevra, and welcome everyone. Uh, I hope that you've been sleeping since the release of the 1950 census on April 1st. Um, I know we were all very excited as this is the uh, most recent census to become available. Now, the census for me is one of my favorite record sets. I really enjoy it because it's a snapshot of what America looked like at a certain um, you know, time of, of year. Um, so it allows us to understand the, the, the social implications, um, and then from a genealogical perspective, we get to see, you know, where our family is living, who they're living around, um, and, and, you know, what's happening in usually April of that, uh, that census year. So the first thing to talk about is, I guess, what the census is. And that's because a lot of times genealogists think about the census as uh, a record that was created for them um, <laughs> to find their family every 10 years uh, and, and to keep track of them. But the, you know, the, the government's purpose of the census, um, which was authored, which was authorized by uh, Article One, Section Two of the U.S. Constitution, is to make an accurate count of the U.S. population, and that's to help with the House of uh, Representative purposes. So for the House and the Senate, uh, it's taken every ten years. The first one happened in August of uh, 1790. The, obviously, the one that is most recently available uh, is our 1950 census, which became available on the 1st of April, 19, uh, that was done on the 1st of April, 1950. Uh, the last census that you took, most likely, um, is uh, from 2020, and we did that as of our household on the 1st of April, so that should be available in 72 years, actually 70, 70 years now. Um, and then the next census to become available, so that 1960 census will be on the 1st of April of 2032. Don't worry, it's just around the corner uh, and, and we'll, be, we'll be doing this all over again. Something that I always strive to explain to people who are looking at census records is how it's tabulated. 
Um, and this is this is true for really any record set that you're using for genealogical research. You have to figure out uh, who decided to take the record and the instructions that they put together of, of how it should be done. Um, and because the census is a federal document, there's a whole lot of regulation around, uh, you know, rules and regulations around who should be doing what at what time and how you should fill out uh, the specific forms. And the same is true, of course, for the 1950 census. So the enumerator, the person who is actually writing down all of the information, all of the detail that your ancestor is providing for their household, um, that person was a temporary employee. In 1950, they did their darndest to make sure that most of them were school teachers. And that was because they typically school teachers were uh, able to write and do arithmetic very, fairly easily. So that they made like the perfect employee um, to be an enumerator for the census. They were assigned a specific region, which is called an enumeration district. And we're gonna talk a lot about enumeration districts today, uh, but they were given a certain area to cover and they weren't supposed to go beyond that particular area. They were given instructions. Um, they, uh, and I'm gonna talk about the instructions in a few slides um, because they were very specific about, again, how they should be filling out um, each of those enumeration forms. They, two things to keep in mind when you're looking at some of the results that you might find is one, they didn't ask for spelling or proof to any of the questions they were asking. So if they said, are you a naturalized citizen? And the person said, yes, they didn't then say, well, show me your naturalization record. They, they, they took their word for it. The same is true about a translator. They did not have translators for the most part. There, there were some instances where they could have, but for the most part, they did not have a translator. So they were. this person was trying to get information from maybe a foreign um, speaker who might not have been um, able to speak English that well. And in that case, you might find some uh, issues with those enumerations. So just something to keep in mind just about the enumerator. Now, again, this is a, a federally run program, right? So there's a whole lot of uh, regulation that goes into that. So there was this huge program for the 1950 census because they needed to get 140,000 enumerators uh, that were uh, going to transcribe all of the persons and the population of the United States at that given time. So there's, it was kind of a, a, you know, a pyramid. There was the chief instructor school those would then um, go to instructor schools. So there's one in St. Louis, there's one in Washington, one in San Francisco. Uh, they then train crew leaders. Those crew, crew leaders are trained in over uh, 508 training locations. Um, and then we get our 140 enumerators. So there's a, a detailed plan in mind as to how these folks are going to uh, learn how to take the census because it's very important for there to be consistency across the board so that someone in California, Texas, Tennessee, and Massachusetts are all taking the enumeration the same way. The instructions are so interesting, maybe just to, maybe just to me, but I think they're so interesting uh, because they give us details on the way that the enumerator should be filling out a question that you might not have thought of. Um, and it, it, so this is going to clarify how the enumerator was filling out the form. So the census instructions are available for all census years uh, at that URL at the top there. So www.census.gov slash history. I use that website all the time. It's fantastic. Um, so that is going to give us information about the instructions themselves. So what are the questions the enumerator should be asking? But for me, the, the part that's most interesting is those clarify items. So um, for example, there was information in the 1950 census that if someone was uh, born in Mexico or of Mexican descent, they should be listed as white. Um, if if someone was from Scotland or Wales, 
Uh, you couldn't write UK, you had to write Scotland, Wales, etc. So you had to be very specific about that. They, they wanted to make sure that Northern Ireland was called out from Ireland. Um, those, that might not be obvious to you when you're, when you're looking at the, the census enumeration. So just something to think about that the, the instructions are driving how the enumerator is filling out that form. The same is true for the procedural uh, portion of that. So if, so if someone's walking down the street, and I'll show you how they were told to walk down the street, because that was part of the instructions, um, and someone was not home, you'll see this on, I, I think, many census records, if you've already been playing around with the 1950 census, there's a, there's a list, there's a listing that will say, uh, not at home. And in that case, you might get really upset because you might think, oh, they skipped over my ancestor, and I'll never find them. Uh, but what they were doing was they, they were following instructions to walk down the street a certain way to, to indicate that someone was not at home. And then later on, they would return to that area and then try to fill in those missing gaps. So you'll find them later on in the census record. So later on in those pages, they always refer to it as page 72. It's not really 72 pages uh, after, but um, don't, don't be discouraged about that. But again, in, in the procedural instructions will help you to identify um, maybe why you can't find your ancestor in the census or why some of the information might have been different from what you know about them. Okay, so how to walk down the street. I'm, I'm not lying about this. This was part of the uh, census instructions. This is actually from 1940, um, but the same was true for, this is the instructions from 1940, but the same was true uh, in 1950. So if you're in an urban area, so if you're in New York City, you should be walking down 2nd Avenue starting at this corner. So see where the starting point is here. Um, you're going to be, you're going to start there. You're going to walk down 2nd Avenue. Then you're going to walk down Forest Court. Then you walk down Forest Street, but you stay on that, that side of the road. You do not cross to the other side, um, you know, when you're making that enumeration. So that will be very important when you're trying to find enumeration districts later on, which I will, I will go over. The same is true for a rural street. So the rural uh, streets, again, you're supposed to be walking in a certain direction. And the enumerator had a, so this where it says lines to be uh, made by enumerator, that was in their own notes. Um, so that's not something you're gonna find um, on the population schedule, but they would, they would indicate how they walk down the street because in these rural, rural areas, it was more difficult for the government to say exactly how to walk down the street, like in these, um, in the, in the blocks that are, um, easier to follow in New York city, for example. Um, so in rural areas, they might've crossed the street, but again, important to think about that, especially when we're, we're talking, when, you know, we're trying to determine, uh, enumeration districts. All right. So what's, what's unique about 1950, other than it's, uh, it's the most recent census to come our way. Um, this is the last census taken door to door. So in 1960, uh, once, when they start taking uh, the census again, that was the first time that they started using self-enumeration forms. So just like we do today, you know, you fill it out in the mail, you send it back, or now you fill it out online and you submit it. Um, that's something that, you know, the government was, was moving in that direction um, after 1950. So this is the last time that an enumerator is going to ask your family for, for information. The next census, it's going to come directly from that person. Now, they, they tested this out. So the last bullet point here on form P2, the individual, uh, I'm sorry, the, the fourth one, the self-enumeration household. Um, so it, they tested out how well this would work um, in Michigan, uh, in a, two counties in Michigan, and in Franklin County in Ohio. And they were just trying to see how well people, they also enumerated those districts. Um, so they wanted to see how well um, the response was in those areas. So that was, uh, you know, really helpful. And apparently they did well enough for the government to decide in 1960 for folks to enumerate themselves um, on their own. Um, the, the, I think the greatest revolutionary uh, 
characteristic of what happened with this 1950 census release is that we started to use artificial intelligence technology to make the census available upon release to the public. So that is a computer reading cursive handwriting. Again, that is a computer reading cursive handwriting to me, which is mind blowing. I didn't think it was going to work. Um, if you've been playing around with this thus far, it works pretty well. Um, it, it, it doesn't find everyone and it's really difficult to find people with common names because it's hard to narrow stuff down, but it did a really good job. And it's, um, it's really exciting news for, for the genealogical community because there's so many things that we could have um, computers look at uh, with cursive handwriting. So um, it's, it's good news, I think. Uh, it also was the first census to uh, track military personnel that are living in uh, barracks type facilities on the on US soil um, travelers that are enumerated um, in campgrounds they they would be done on this p2 form. Uh, the p2 form doesn't exist anymore they threw it away. Uh, <laughs> but it was uh, something that they were keeping track of so you might see if you know if you when you start to look at more resources about the 1950 census, you might see some um references to folks that are uh, enumerated outside of the united states so like you know folks that are that are in the u.s military or something like that um those didn't make it uh past um getting microfilmed unfortunately so i actually have a list of things that they threw away um <laughs> because it's very frustrating uh, un I, it's understandable, but it's also frustrating. So in the 60s, um, I believe it was, yeah, the, the late 60s, the National Archives started microfilming the 1950 census. So you'll see uh, references to the housing form. So when they, when they talk about the, the population schedule, they'll say population and housing. And the reason that they say those two things together is that the front page the page that you see on Ancestry.com or Family Search or the NARA website, that is the population schedule. On the back side of that, there was um, housing information. That was, do you have a washing machine? How many bathrooms do you have? Do you have uh, running water? Um, how many rooms are in your house? All sorts of lovely information um, about your ancestor's household. Uh, they did not microfilm that side that back side of the population schedule. And once they had it filmed, they threw it all away. So we do not have housing information, unfortunately. The same is true for the agricultural schedule. Um, alongside the population schedule, so when an enumerator came to the house and said, who lives here and answered all those questions, one of the questions they asked was, is this a farm? If it was a farm, then they would move to a second schedule and fill out the agricultural schedule. And there's all sorts of stuff on there, like what crops are you growing and how many cattle do you have and how many acres and so on and so forth. All of that gone. They threw it away. They didn't think it was, they, they tabulated the information. So they got the data that they were looking for, the statistics, but then they, they threw the rest of it away. Um, the same is true for infant cards. There were separate cards that were filled out by the enumerator for folks who were born in January, February, March of 1950. Uh, these cards had a variety of detail on them. Uh, how big was the child when it was born? Where was it born? So on and so forth. The thing that kills me is that one of the questions they asked was the maiden name of the mother. Uh, and again, they, they threw those away. Um, and then the same is true for uh, the P2 form that I just mentioned, so that overseas population, uh, that was something that, again, they tabulated and, and then tossed. And uh, they took some aerial photographs also of enumeration districts, and those didn't end up uh, making it past the National Archives. So a few things that we, we didn't get to keep, um, but we still have the population schedule. So uh, we'll, we'll be happy, I guess, um, w with that. Okay, so there were a lot of questions asked in 1950, and I'm not going to go through all of them uh, because it's, this is very knowable information. Um, this is available on the National Archives website. Um, I'm going to provide a worksheet for everyone that you can download after this, uh, this webinar for you to look at all of the questions that are asked. 
Um, but I'm, I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of what you should be, uh, what you can um, expect from, from these uh, enumeration schedules. So uh, they recorded, of course, the person's name, their relationship to the head of household, the race, the sex, the age on their last birthday, whether they were married, where, uh, where they were born, whether or not they were naturalized. They give detailed information about where the household is. So the street name, the street number, uh, whether or not it's a, whether it's a house or a farm, um, you know, general questions that you see on most census records, not just 1950. This is, this is fairly standard. They did ask a whole lot of questions about employment though. Um, and I, I think that this was probably because we were, you know, coming out of uh, the Great Depression, coming out of World War II and seeing, again, this is a, a government a government record. So they're trying to see like where the population is going, you know, what, what does employment look like? What is the, um, the, the financial situation situation look like for most of Americans? So they're asking questions about, you know, did you work this week? Did you, I feel like it's like, did you work this week? Did you work last week? Did you work, you know, but they, they wanted to know if they were working, were you looking for work? What kind of work was it? Uh, what industry you work in, what kind of class worker you are, class of worker you are, Again, 15 through 20 and 20 C, all those questions are about employment. So that is the population schedule. Everyone was asked those questions that we just went over. Then 20% of the population was asked supplemental questions. And this is something that they started in 1940. Um, but they didn't ask, there weren't very many uh, people that were called out for those supplemental questions. There was, I think there was only two lines or three lines on the 1940 census. Uh, in 1950, the lines that are called out are three, eight, 13, 18, 23, and 28. So that's 28, that's 20% 20 of the population that's asking these supplemental, that's answering these supplemental questions. Again, <laughs> they're asking uh, uh, employment questions. Um, but also where the person was living. So were you living in the same place a year ago? Um, if you were not living in that same place, where were you living? Um, it, was it a different country? Was it a different state? Then they asked questions about where the father and the mother were born, the, the, the country uh, where your father and mother were born. The highest grade of uh, education the person received and then whether or not they finished. Uh, so there's, you know, questions about uh, education as well. And then, of course, we go back to the, the employment stuff. So uh, questions 29 through 32C, all questions about employment. Uh, we, again, looking for work. How much did you earn? Uh, how much money did you receive in interest or dividends for, or a veteran's allowance? There's this, all this great information about, um, about employment and uh, the, the financial situation. Many people did not like answering these questions and they did offer the option to fill, to uh, submit a confidential questionnaire. So um, the person could just fill that out and then mail that into the census. That's something that, you know, you're not gonna really be able to find. That's just what they used for, uh, the, the census would have, uh, tallied all that information up and then most likely thrown away with that answer, that confidential questionnaire um, included. Finally, we have a few supplemental questions for males. Did you ever serve in the armed forces? They asked specifically about World War I, World War II, um, or any time or any other present service. Again, great, great information to know. And then in addition to that 20% of people who were, um, who were given that supplemental question, we get an additional question for line 28. Line 28 is, is asked uh, questions 34 th through 38. And uh, that would constitute about three and a half percent of the United States population. 
of course, they're asking more questions about employment. I don't even know if they could have, I don't know how they have more questions about employment at this point, but they asked three more questions or four more questions about employment. Um, and then they ask about uh, the marriage, marriage status of the person, whether or not they've ever been widowed, divorced, or separated. And then they also ask about, uh, they are asking females specifically if they've ever been married and how many children they have, how many, how many were born. So if you're lucky enough to have someone enumerated on line 28 of the census, they have to answer all of these questions. Now, I'm sure you can already see that there are common problems in this situation. So just there's an enumerator coming to the door and asking questions. So there's already a situation where the person providing that, if there could be, you know, a lost in translation meaning from the person who's answering the question to the person recording the information. Um, you'll also find that people misremember uh, answers to quite, or, uh, you know, information that, that the census taker is looking for. Um, they might not trust the census taker. There could be a language barrier, like I was men mentioning before. Sometimes the, um, the instructions or the question are confusing and they might not have gotten that correct. And then, of course, there's situations where, you know, there's a lot of misspelling, um, misunderstanding what the person uh, said for their first name or their last name. Uh, and then there's situations where people are um, multiple, they're, they're enumerated more than once. And that usually is because, you know, the enumerator is not walking down the street the correct way. Um, or someone could have moved between the enumerations. I mean, that's like a very slim possibility, but they might have moved like on April 3rd and then on April 5th been enumerated again. Um, you know, that could happen. Um, so just be aware of that. It doesn't happen very often, but, but there are instances where there's multiple enumerations. So a whole bunch of reasons why uh, there might be mistakes. Okay, so now why we're all here. So how, where are we locating these census records? I'm gonna talk about three locations. Um, the National Archives and Records Administration, um, which has made all of those census records available and they've, they've all been avail made available using that artificial technology. So we're gonna talk about them um, actually last of the three, uh, but they're the ones that own quote unquote, own the 1950 census. There's Ancestry.com. Ancestry has made some of those states searchable. Most of them are browse only. There's Family Search. Family Search is making, uh, making them available right now browse only. Um, they are working very hard to get all of those records and, uh, indexed. And again, this, this webinar is going to be uh, very time sensitive. So anything that's happening after uh, what's today, the 14th of April, uh, you know, things are going to change fairly rapidly in the next, you know, month or two. Uh, so just be aware of that. Um, the other site that's making them available is MyHeritage. I'm not going to talk about MyHeritage, but they are making some states searchable um, and they're mostly browse only. And if you wanted to see these originals, you can't. Uh, they destroyed those originals uh, again in the, I think the late 60s. Okay, so Ancestry will be the first place that we talk about. Um, Ancestry has the 1950 federal census collection up on their website. So it will look like this. And you'll notice that there's a place to put in first and middle name and then last name and then birth information and so on. That's there because eventually you will be able to search the 1950 census, just like you do 1940, 1910, and so on. But right now, that search feature does not work that well. Um, it's only going to search the states that they've indexed. And I'll tell you what those states are in a short moment. So you don't want to use that search feature. You want to use their browsable feature. And you'll see um, right underneath where it says National Archives provided an association on the right here where it says browse this collection. That's what you're going to go to if, if you want to see the images um, of an enumeration district. There's just a few steps that need to go along with that, and I'll walk you through those. So if you want to browse and you use that browsable feature, you can choose the state, the county, and be careful with the county because the way that they um, 
they organize that is that if it's a if it's a city that's in a county that is large it's going to be specifically listed under that city so in this case lowell in middlesex lowell is a large enough city to have its own um it, it's organized under its own entity so it's not so there's going to be also the option to pick middlesex is what i mean so if you're looking in lowell you can't pick middlesex you have to pick the lowell middlesex then you choose the populated place so again it's going to default to lowell and then it will give you all the enumeration districts there's a ton of them in all of these locations there's going to be many enumeration districts associated with a specific place there's a description given after so you'll see 21-1 is in lowell and it's part of Ward 1, which is bounded by the Merrimack River, Andover Avenue, East Merrimack, and so on and so forth. I don't expect you to know the enumeration district. I also want you to be aware that if you found your family in 1940 in an enumeration district, and you think, I'm just going to look in the same enumeration district, the government doesn't work that way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they change the enumeration district. Uh, so you can't do it that way. So you have to find, um, you, you have to do some research on where that enumeration, like where the street is that you're looking for in that enumeration district. And I'll, I'll go over how to do that um, in a little bit. But you can, if you happen to know the, the, the um, enumeration district you're looking for, you could click on this hyperlink. So where it says 21-1, if you just click there, it will bring you to that enumeration districts um, collection, which is, I'll show you on the next slide, um, what it looks like. So if you were to click there, this is the first page of, it's actually the first page of, of enumeration district 21-112. So you'll get this title page, and then you'll see that this is image one of 28 on the bottom here. And that means that there's 28 images in this collection. And if you want a page forward, you do that on the right uh, with that little arrow, the little carrot arrow to the right. And um, that's how you'll be able to go through and search all, look at all 28 images. So if your ancestors are in 21-112, like mine, um, here's my, um, my Fulton ancestors um, who are going to be enumerated. Um, so this is what one of the enumeration looks looks like. So you'll notice that the top half or so uh, includes questions about the population. And that's the questions that we I said everyone was going to answer. Then the supplemental stuff is is like the, the last third, I guess it's we'll call it thirds. So that's the last third of um, of that census collection. So, so it's going to be asking those supplemental questions uh, there, and that's where it's going to be enumerated. You'll notice uh, on the side here uh, that all of these, these are the call outs for those additional people who are asked that question. So that's, th that's uh, rows 3, 8, 13, 18, 23, and 28. And then 28, the last one there being the, the folks who are going to be asked those additional three, the three and a half percent of the population being asked those additional questions. So right now the searchable states at ancestry.com are Delaware, Vermont, Wyoming, and the territory of America Samoa, American Samoa. They are currently working on Alaska, New Hampshire, and the US Virgin Islands. That is going to be updated again um, I mean, I, I, I put this particular slide together yesterday, so things could change between uh, yesterday and today. So that's currently where they're at. So if you had someone uh, enumerate, if you have family in Delaware, for example, if you were to search the 1950 census, that should, uh, that should work at this point. Okay, so the second company that is uh, providing images of the 1950 census is Family Search. Family Search is releasing it slightly differently than Ancestry. Um, they also are making it available browse only. It's super hard to find the browse only images, and I'm going to tell you a better way of doing it uh, later on in this in this chat. 
Uh, but there is a way for you to browse the collections at FamilySearch. What they're trying to get folks to do right now is to help to review the index. And if you are interested in helping with that, um, I'll show you on the, the next slide here. You can, this is, this is the browse feature that's almost impossible to find. <laughs> so, uh, but I do wanna show you it because there's a way to link to this that I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you from, from Steve Morse's uh, website in, in a little bit, and it will bring you to this page. So you'll see it, it works kind of like Ancestry's uh, image does. So you'll get that first page, uh, that title page, and then uh, on the top uh, left, it says image one of 31. So you can page forward um, through those images to get to the image that, you know, to get to the street that you're trying to look for. Um, so still has the browse feature on family search. It's just a little hidden and difficult to navigate. Uh, and, and again, I'll, I'll show you how to do that. The easiest thing to do on family search is to help them with their index um, currently. So there's some states that they've, they've already done or they're almost done with. Um, and this map kind of, well, this map shows you where, where they are. Uh, so they're working mainly in uh, Florida, Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah. Uh, oh boy. Is that Washington or Oregon? Now you'll know that I'm from the East Coast and it's always difficult for us to remember it. That's Oregon um, <laughs> and Idaho. So um, those are the states that they started with. There's some of the, the ones that are in white here, they started, there's zero to 24% of those done, um, but the most part are the not available states. Um, if you want to help, to index some of those records, they're going to give you records that are in those, those yellow states or those, or those white states. So you'll see here, uh, if you decide to help with the index, they highlight things for you in blue, which is lovely. Um, you can, and then it will ask you to select all the members of that household. So you'll see six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 here. And then you can check mark all of those, those items. Again, a computer is reading the, uh, this handwriting. Some cases it's cursive, some cases it's print handwriting like it is in this, in this situation. So you're just double checking what the computer did. And it does a darn good job. I mean, I didn't find too many mistakes uh, in this particular entry. So I went through um, and helped with, with five through 16, I think. Um, in this particular household. So you just keep, you just, you know, enter in what you found and then you hit next. And then family search is doing everything. So it's not just looking at the first names, last names, and, you know, years of birth and all of that. They're asking for help with um, occupation where, you know, where someone works. So all of those questions that are, you know, about employment and, and education and all that, that's what's gonna be uh, searchable for, on the family search site once it's completed. So if you're helping with the index, this is an instance where I'm helping with Nellie. You can see Nellie, uh, according to the computer, it says picks build, which that's not right. But if you go over here, you can see it says picks berries. So I would change that then to picks berries on a farm and then I would hit this next button, um, and that would help um, the index understand that you know it's it's slightly different. Um, and then when you get to the end, you get this little you know way to go, uh, and you can continue on if you'd like, or you can stop there. Um, I stopped there, but because uh, I just wanted to show you guys how how that page works. Um, but that will help to make all of these records searchable on Family Search once you know we get through all of this. Um, this indexing. So the final site uh, and the one that we're going to spend the most time with is the 1950 census website at the National Archives. And so this is there, when you go to the, the page, this is the first page that you'll see. Um, on the right side there, it says resources. That's a tremendous amount of information about the 1950 census. Frequently asked questions, where to find the, uh, you know, um, the, the questionnaire 
the questions on the questionnaire, uh, where to find census instructions, all that kind of stuff. There's webinars, there's all sorts of lovely information that's made available by the lovely people at the National Archives um, under that resources tab. But for our instance, for our situation here, we want to just begin the search. So you click on this little red button here and we, we begin the search. Now, this is using artificial in intelligence and the optical recognition technology, so OCR technology. Again, a computer is trying to read the enumerator's handwriting from 1950. And I've found that for the most part, it does a pretty good job. I would say 70% of the time it finds what, who you're looking for. Maybe, maybe a little bit less than that. Um, especially if you know where they're living. So you'll see, um, the, the search field on the, the 1950s, so if you click search, this is where it brings you. One of the first things that we'll ask is for the state and the county or the city. It's really good if you can fill that out. If you can't fill that out and you're looking for John Brown, like you're not going to find John Brown. You're going to need to narrow it down some, you know, some way. If you have someone that has a unique name, you might not have to narrow this down. But for the most part, you probably do. The search fields that are on the NARA site that are using, again, the computer to, to look through all of the census records that are available are using these four search fields. There's location, which is state or the county or the city. Uh, there's name, which is first and last name, and then enumeration district. And if they happen to be on the Indian reservation schedule, they will, um, you know, that's another option for you. Uh, the, there is an Indian reservation schedule that's accompanying the population schedule, that, that the P1 schedule. And I'm just going to talk really quickly about the Indi Indian reservation schedule because this would be like its own webinar. So I, I couldn't really go over all the details of what was in it. Um, generally speaking, it's persons who are enumerated um, on reservations. It does not include the state of Oklahoma or Alaska for whatever reason. I don't know why they didn't take one there, but they didn't. Um, and most of the time you will be able to find someone living on a reservation in the population schedule. So you, you should find them in two places. Um, again, I, I didn't play around with this a whole lot, so I'm not sure about you know if you would find them in two places but definitely something to check okay <clears throat> excuse me so using the index what we want to do then is like i was mentioning before we'd like to narrow down the location so we're going to be looking for my family and this is uh, in Lowell in Middlesex County. We're looking for John Fulton. I don't know the enumeration district that John Fulton is living in. I know that he lives on Anderson Street, um, but I don't know the enumeration district at this point. But I want to see if the computer can find him. And I'm not kidding. The first time that I did this, he was the first entry that came up. I, there's a few John Fultons that live in, in Lowell. So um, I was kind of surprised by that. But this is, this is him living um, in enumeration district 21-163. And you'll notice, um, I want to bring your attention to the bottom here. That the, so Because this is, this is how it's indexed. So this is how the computer has indexed it. So you'll see... The, what's highlighted is John is is Fulton, and then John. So he's number three here, right? And then next to that is Annie, and next to that is Catherine. Next to that is Robert. So all of those people, Annie, Catherine, Robert, Cicely, Charlene, Murphy, all of them are Fultons. So Annie Fulton, Catherine Fulton, Robert Fulton. So if you were looking for Robert Fulton, for example and you searched for Robert Fulton, it would be a lot harder to find him because those two names are not together. John Fulton, on the other hand, those names are together. So if you search for the head of household, 
the computer is indexing it that way because that's the only place that the surname shows up because there's always ditto marks for the for the rest of them right so when when you've looked at census records before so that's why it's important when you're searching to search for um to search for that full name and just search for the head of household if you know who the head of household is that's a big if <laughs> So that's my tip. My tip is searching by the name of the head of household. Um, it will help you to narrow down the, you know, what the computer is finding for uh, possible entries. Now you'll probably find that um, it, it's not always exact and you'll want to update what the index has. And I'm gonna walk you through how to do that um, in a little bit. Um, but so the, so this is this is my family. John Fulton here is the uh, he's uh, the third person listed on here. Um, he's listed as the head of household, and then you'll see that everyone um, after that are his child are his wife and then children. So Annie, his spouse, uh, Catherine, his daughter, Robert, his son, and then you'll notice after that is Sicily, and Sicily is his daughter in law. So that is the wife of Robert. And then after that is Charlene. So that is how uh, the census instructions explain to the enumerator how to enumerate the household. It's supposed to be done in this particular order. And then again, you can see you know, people who are living um, around them. Um, Robert Fulton, my, my uncle Bob, he served in World War II. He was a fighter pilot and uh, he, he extended his service beyond World War II. So he actually is enumerated um, he's one of the people who gave the answers to the supplemental questions. You'll see him on line six here. Um, so this is the question about where someone was living the year prior. Um, and he's he's at Westover Field um, in, in Hamden County in Massachusetts. He also gives some additional information about his family, right? His dad is born in the United States. His mom's born in Scotland. Uh, he answers a whole bunch of questions about his uh, employment. He worked last year for 52 weeks. He made, looks like $5,500. Um, and it also, he checked the box that, or the enumerator checked the box that he was uh, serving during World War II. Now I mentioned you can help with the index. This is my grandfather's uh, entry. Um, and his name um, is, is William Fulton. So uh, you'll, you'll see here that, that the name is a little screwed up um, on the bottom. So I want to help first myself uh, find him later on, um, if, you know, if, I, if I'm showing him to family members or whatnot or explaining uh, how to do this, then I, I want someone to be able to find him. So you can help with the index as well on the National Archives website, on the NARA website. And if you want to do that, um, the option is, I'll show you on the next slide here. Um, you, you see where it says, help us transcribe names. That's an option on, uh, you know, right above where the enumeration shows up. So if you, if you click help us transcribe names, it will ask you for your email address. You give them the email address. It asks you, it, it will send you a code to your email. You put that in and then you can help them. Um, to, to transcribe who those people are. So you pick the, the line number. So how someone's enumerated, like where they are, what, what, um, what row they are. So 23, for example. And then once you click that, it will bring you to the next page and will allow you to fill out the, the prefix, the last name, the first name, the middle name. Now, I know my grandfather's middle name is John. That doesn't mean I get to fill out John. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't think, you don't get extra points um, for, for, for providing that information. And there's someone that's checking all of this. So um, in that case, the, it probably would get corrected to just be the J because it should just be exactly what is uh, you know, transcribed on or uh, you know, enumerated on the, the schedule. So you'll see, here that there's William J. Fulton. He's listed as the head of household. And then Laura L. Laura L. is my grandmother. It was read by the computer as, as being Larry. 
Um, and then Barbara J is my aunt. It, that also was butchered. Um, so I, I needed to help with that. So I entered both, uh, I entered William, Laura and Barbara, uh, you know, to help with that index. It takes about, they say 24 hours to make the changes. I submitted this a few days ago and it's still not changed, but I'm sure they have thousands upon thousands of, of, of edits to correct. So I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt there. Okay. So we just went over how to search when you know where someone's living and, um, you know, or you know where someone's living and you're able to search by head of household. Now we're going to talk about searching by enumeration district. So the first thing is finding the address. We need to think about what information is, uh, what, um, what records contain information about addresses. We can find that on vital records, obviously city directories or phone books. I want and encourage you to look at what you already have in your own house, like ask your family where they were living in 1950. Um, or if you have postcards or letters uh, that might have an address on there. You can use newspapers to find out that information. There's draft cards that will have addresses on there. Um, if someone applied for a social security number, they might have an SS5 application that will have that as well. Um, and I, I even had the, the suggestion, and I don't hate it, is, is looking at some old photos and seeing if you can maybe figure out the, the, uh, the number of the household. Uh, you know, to get the address that way. So be as creative as you can, because it's really important to find that, um, that address. So the second step is finding the enumeration district. There's two sites that I really like for this. Um, at, there's enumeration maps available at the National Archives and Family Search and, and um, Ancestry.com, um, but also at this uh, free website called stevemorris.org. Um, so the two sites I'm going to talk about for enumeration district maps are Ancestry.com and Steve Morris, because I found that those two are the most helpful. Ancestry.com is so easy to navigate. They have this district finder. You put in the address. So in this case, I put in Alden Street in Anaconda, which is in Deer Lodge County in Montana. I had some family that moved out to, to Montana upon leaving Ireland. Um, and I know they lived on Alden Street. So I type that in, I hit search, and it gives spits out the enumeration district, 12-24. So easy. Um, you can even double check their work. So if you click on the map, it will scroll, um, it'll move down. So you can see here, Alden, right by 12-24 by in Ward 6, Alden Street is right there. You'll also notice that a line runs right down Alden Street. So you have to be very careful that your family might be uh, enumerated in this 12-20 in Ward 5. Um, it just kind of depends on what side of the street your family lives on. But in this case, 12-24 is exactly where they were, and that's how I was able to find them. Now, that works really well for places that are not New York City or Boston or <laughs> Philadelphia or LA. Um, the moment that we have a large population and, and, and very small enumeration districts for um, many streets, you might have to use a different, um, a different service. And in this case, I would say using Steve Morse for that, it's incredibly helpful. So uh, this is the, the, the first page that you see when you go onto the website. There's the US Census um, as an option on the left there. And then you just choose uh, the 1950 census viewer. Now, when you do that, it will bring you to where you can enter the address. Now, in this case, um, we're going to be looking for my grandmother who lived in the Bronx. So I pick New York, Bronx, Bronx County. It's in the city called the Bronx. Um, I knew she lived at 530, 150 East Street. Uh, and when I do that, it gives me some options. In fact, it gives me a lot of options, too many options for me to look through. Um, so I need to narrow it down more. And the way that you do that is <laughs> using Google. So see, <laughs> it, it gives you the option. You can click right on it so you don't have to fill in the information again. You just hit look at Google Maps. It brings you right there, pinpoints it for you, and then you look at 
the cross streets, the one behind, in front, and off to the side. So we have Brook Ave here, and then one uh, East 149th Street. Um, it got cut off here, but on the on the right is actually St. Anne's. So those are the streets that we need to know in order to narrow down where this enumeration district is. So once we know this information, then we go back to the to the Steve Morse site and you can choose that. So see where it says cross or back street. We have Brook Ave, 149th East Street, and St. Anne's Ave. And when we do that, it gives me one enumeration district. Uh, it's enumeration district 3-399. And the reason that I needed to know this enumeration district is that my grandmother's name is Mary Mohan and she was living in, in the Bronx, New York. It's way too hard for us to, to figure that out. Um, so uh, I need to be paging through that. So now that I know the enumeration district, I can click on that and it will bring me, um, well, I can, I can go and browse by enumeration district and, and get to that, uh, that set of records to find who I'm looking for. So the Steve Moore site, when we were there, it gave you the option of searching on Ancestry, Family Search, or the National Archives, and it links right to that enumeration district. So if you have an Ancestry.com account, you can just click on there and it will bring you right here. And then you're looking at 3-399 and you can just page through to find who you're looking for. And in this case, I page through um, uh, to, to, to find my, my grandmother. Um, this is what it looks like if you were to click on the family search link, it will bring you to this page and then you can page through to find uh, who you're looking for. So if you don't have an ancestry.com account and you'd like to look at family search, you can do that here. And like I was saying before, it's kind of clunky. So uh, th it, that might be the best way of, of you getting to, to the family search site. And then you're going to page forward to the correct address. Now, here, here they are. Um, Patrick Mohan is the head of household. I knew Patrick Mohan was the head of household. I knew they were living in the Bronx. When I searched for it, it didn't come up. If you'll see his name there, you can tell that either the enumerator did not hear what he said, or he just doesn't know how to spell Patrick. Because it's Pal Crick. Pal Crick. Um, I mean, he was from Ireland, but... I, that seems like a, a, a butchering of the, the way that you would spell that. So it was not coming up when I was searching it, is my point. So this is a, a situation where you had to, to page through to look for someone in an enumeration district. Okay. Now, when you find someone on the census, it's so exciting and it's wonderful and you learn so much about you know, who, who they were as people and, and, and you can see what the household, what the household looked like and also what the neighborhood looked like. But I want you to think about the 1950 census as a springboard for other records because there's so much stuff that exists for this time frame um, that can tell you more information about your ancestor. So I, I put together this worksheet and this is something that Ginevra is going to email you after this, um, after this meeting. Um, so you'll, you'll find uh, an email about this once we end this session. It will give you the opportunity to download this worksheet because what I want you to think about is filling these out for each person that you find on the census. So uh, their answers to all these questions, like the name of the street, the apartment number, the house number, is it a house or a farm? Um, you know, is it on more than three acres, et cetera, et cetera. And then what I did was in this column that says search for these records, I suggested some records that you could think about locating in order to, um, you know, move on from there. So if you know the name of the street, you should be looking for maps. You should be looking for fire insurance maps, newspapers. Who knows? It might be on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, you know, there's, there's applications for that. If you find uh, where the house number is, you might have them on city directories or phone books or, um, land records, uh, all sorts of tax lists. There's all sorts of records that exist. So think about that. So it's not just the answer that they're giving on the 1950 census, but what other information can you find out about them? What other records can you look for um, to expand your knowledge of, of who that person was? And the same goes, I, I went through all of them. I did um, 
combine many of those employment <laughs> questions all into the same, I, I, you know, rolled them up all into one, but there are employment records for you to look for. I mean, if the person worked for the federal government or was a municipal employee, there's probably stuff about that. Um, you know, look at city directories, newspapers. Um, what there was one person on my team that mentioned that her, uh, her grandmother, when she got married, she was a school teacher. And when she got married, she had to resign and her resignation, her letter of resignation was printed in the newspaper. So stuff like that. I mean, I, I want you to really be thinking outside the box when it comes to, uh, some alternative records for, for putting your ancestor in a, in a particular time and place. We have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have on our site, um, on American Ancestors, we've pulled together all of the census resources that that we have. Um, many of them are me babbling on about about the census uh, uh, for, as, for webinars and and um, and and some of our uh, subject guides. So everything that we have is, is located there. Um, this is a free a free site that we have. So please take a look at, at what's available there. The worksheet that I just I just talked about uh, is going to be made available there in the future. Um, so you can you can find that there. And then, like I mentioned at the beginning of this whole thing, uh, the National Archives put together this 1950 resources page. Again, it's it's beautiful. They did a great job, uh, you know, providing frequently asked questions and in training videos and finding aids and all sorts of wonderful things. And again, because it's the government, it's free, which is great. So uh, please take advantage of that as well. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, before we get to your questions, and there are several questions in the Q&A panel, um, I did want to invite you to a few upcoming programs. Tomorrow, Friday, April 15th, Melanie McComb will demonstrate some of the external databases that you can access from home as a member. These are other third-party subscription sites that you can access, again, from home through your membership at American Ancestors. Um, so definitely pay attention or register for that. It's also not too late to register for our in-person seminar, the Genealogical Skills Bootcamp, which will be held at our research center in Boston um, in May. And if you didn't get enough of the census um, and you want to learn more about getting the most out of all U.S. federal censuses, uh, from the earliest to the most recent, to moving beyond population schedules, to finding those elusive ancestors, be sure to join Lindsay for a five-week online course starting in June. And you can learn more about all of these programs, as well as all of our other programs at AmericanAncestors.org slash events. So let's get to some questions. Um, we've had a few people ask about how enumerations worked for prisons, institutions, um, colleges, you know, where you have a large body of people living and residing. Um, how, how do those institutions kind of show up in the census? Great question. The enumerators were told to enumerate the people who are um, living in a census, I'm sorry, living in a uh, prison or an institution or an orphanage or a, uh, or a college, university, um, boarding school, anything like that. They're all enumerated in that location. Um, so if an enumerator came to your, to, a, to your house and you had a college-aged kid who was, who was away, um, th they should not have enumerated that person in that household. Uh, the institution itself should be its own enumeration district. Like it shouldn't split up over several of them. Um, they might only assign one enumeration district depending on the size of the school, like if it's Penn State or something like that. You know, they might say like, this is... <laughs> um, the, the, the school is only going to be enumerated in this one district. And then, uh, you know, dormitories and, and it, well, I, I guess dormitories would be included with the institution, but uh, apartments that are outside of that area, or if there's housing outside of that area, then it would be in its own enumeration district. But um, it, they're going to try to keep it all in the same uh, place. Um, I, I did my, my, my master's work on a institution in Rentham, Massachusetts, um, and that spans several buildings and acres even, um, and that was all considered one, um, one enumeration district. A few people have also asked about, you know, you, you showed us 
um, different ways that where the indexing is wrong, you can provide the correct information. Um, what about if the information on the census itself is wrong? They, you know, put Robert instead of Roberta, or that, you know, it was um, the relationship to the head of household is wrong, or, or you know, it's clearly indexed correctly, or it's, mm. um, you know, written clearly, but it's the information is wrong. How do you, um, can you correct that? Unfortunately, there's nothing you can do about that. Um, Ancestry has an option to where, um, and this will be available once they, uh, once they index the, the, the census, but they, they have an option available that, and you may have seen it before when searching on Ancestry, that puts things in brackets. So if you know, as the family member of the person, or maybe even are the person who, who's on the census, um, you can say like, it's supposed to be Robert. It's not supposed to be, you know, Roberta or whatever. Um, and that will show up um, as a bracketed item. But in terms of like correcting the record with the National Archives, correcting the record with the with the government, that's not something that um, you're able to do. And they consider that to be like a historic document. So it's, it's, it is what it is. It's, it's not really changeable at this point. Now, I know in the 1940 census, they had a little X next to the person who answered the questions, who was providing that information to the enumerator. Does that exist for the 1950 census, or is there any way of knowing who actually provided the information? They did not include, that's not an option for um, the 1950 census, that they didn't ask that question, uh, or they didn't indicate that in a particular way. Um, I always like to guess who answered the question and you can usually tell based on um the answers that people are giving <laughs> um who who that person is so you know if if they get the information about their wife wrong it's probably not the wife answering the question um and, and you know, unless they were you know trying to hide information for some reason but what you can do is look at at the answers to all of that so what the household answered um, and then kind of figure out from from um, process of elimination, like you know who the person was. They did. They did. I mean, there there are some instances where there's like different handwriting on the enumeration, so you, uh, on the on the schedule. So it might be a situation where um, uh, you know folks were were just asked to 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 provide that information. So. Um, definitely something to, to think about when you're looking at your own um, uh, household being enumerated that like maybe you might recognize someone's handwriting. Um, I don't think officially that's not what the instructions said to do, uh, but I have seen so many different instances where there's different people, like different handwritings on an enumeration that it doesn't make sense why, um, why that would be the case if it's only one enumerator filling out the form. And if no one was home, could they ask a neighbor? Did the enumerator come back? They um, so they should have come back and they should have tried three times. So they were they were adamant about getting the information from the household um, and not asking neighbors. So, um, and there's a whole thing in the instructions on, you know, how many times you should come back and what time of day and maybe try on a Sunday. Um, <laughs> Uh, you're not going to get overtime, but try on a Sunday. Uh, they, they tried really, really hard to, to get the household, the household, a member of the household to answer the question. Now that doesn't mean that, well, they also said that they didn't want kids answering the question, but that doesn't mean that kids didn't provide, um, didn't act as interpreters for their parents, which will happen many, many a time. Um, and there's a lot of instances where, where you know, 12, 12, you know, kids that are like 12 years old probably answered those questions, um, you know, for their parents. But in theory, the neighbor could answer the question, but they were strongly encouraged for that not to happen. And just to clarify, so the, the census date is April 1st, 1950. So if anything happened, you know, people were born, people moved into the residence after that date, they should not be in the census, correct? And they wouldn't show up until 1960. Correct. Yes. If someone died in your house, um, prior, so uh, if someone died after April 1st, 
and the enumerator came around and asked questions, they should be on the census. If that's if that's overly complicating things. So if if some if if someone in your household died on April fourth, and the enumerator came to your household on April eighth, that person should be enumerated. Um, on that 1950 schedule because they they would they were living on April 1st. So it's it's a snapshot of what the household looked like on April 1st. And just another a few questions about that browse feature on family search. So mm -hmm. you were saying it's kind of clunky, it's hidden. Are you recommending going to stevemorse.org and yes. then kind of going around it that way? 1000%. Yes. Um, it is so I, I honestly can't find it like I and I'm a, I would consider myself to be a pretty savvy family search user. I use family search almost every day. I could not figure out where they hit it. Um, Steve figured it out. Good for him. Um, and he and he linked it on his site. So if you, once you find that enumeration district, he he's provided a lovely situation for you so that you can look at um, the link straight to Ancestry, the link straight to uh, Family Search, the link straight to the National Archives. Great. And let's see, just a few more questions. I know we're over time, but um, you know there were quite a few questions. Um, Menora says, "I'm uh, mostly looking at the census in Puerto Rico. Are the forms for the fifty states the same as Puerto Rico, with the exception of language?" Again, same questions. Yes, they should have been the same questions. As far as I know, um, I didn't see anything different for the territories, but the language definitely will be different. Um, and they they would have been, they would have hired enumerators from Puerto Rico, so they everyone should be speaking Spanish, <laughs> um, or, or should be able to speak Spanish uh, at that point. All right, and um, I think the question, well, a lot of people are asking too about when do you think um, the census will be fully indexed on family search, ancestry, my heritage? Any guesses <laughs> or well, insider information that you have? So, uh, the, the so since the computer can read can, can does a, such a good job read. I mean, I'm I'm honestly like really floored by how well the computer is reading the handwriting. Now, granted, the handwriting in 1950 is pretty good. I mean, I haven't really seen any enumerations where it just looks like it's from you know 1790. Um, I, I I suspect that, and and I I believe Ancestry is also using this technology. So. If Ancestry is using this technology and so is Family Search, and then they're just relying on humans to just kind of double check it, it moves so much faster. So in, in the olden days, when we did not use a computer to do this, it usually took about six months before it was like fully searchable. So I'm going to say it's probably going to take three, maybe four, um, maybe less. It, it, it all depends on, on, um, on how enthusiastic everyone is to to either help family search or how how many people ancestry is paying to 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 get through I, I don't have the inside track on that but it's definitely moving faster than it has in the past um and then final question uh several people also are asking just um for some clarification on how um active military would be um enumerated so if they are you know, not in the household, but serving on a base somewhere or, um, you know, in a different theater, would they be enumerated? So if, if someone is serving on a base that is in a U.S. territory or on U.S. soil, they will be on the population schedule. So if they're serving in um, Puerto Rico or uh, U.S. Virgin Islands or, you know, one of those, um, then, or even Alaska and Hawaii at this point. Um, if, if they are serving there, they will be enumerated with the population schedule. If they are serving in like Germany on a, on a base in Germany, they 
were counted. They were part of that P2 schedule and that schedule was thrown away because all they did was uh, they calculated where the people were um, to help with, again, because the, the point of the, the census is to help with the House of Representatives and the, and the Senate. So, um, well, House of Representatives mainly. Uh, so they're getting that information in terms of what the population looks like. So they, they calculated all that, they tabulated all that, and then they just threw that information away. If that helps to answer the question. So if they are on US soil, on a base on US soil in the population schedule, if they are on a military base that is in a different country, I mean, technically, I guess it is US soil if it's a military base, but if it's in a different country, um, then they are not part of the population schedule enumeration. All right. Well, thank you again so much, Lindsay. Um, your, <laughs> I think your um, enjoyment and love of the census definitely came through. So thank you for sharing that with all of us. Um, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. If you have more specific questions about your family history research, you may consider scheduling a consultation or hiring our research services team. You can learn more about those services by contacting research at nehgs.org. Um, and then we also have a free chat, uh, free chat service. So you can chat with a genealogist again for free. It's open to the public um, Tuesday through Saturday, 9 to 5 p.m. Eastern time with extended hours on Wednesdays. That's 9 to 8 p.m. Eastern time. Um, so if you have reference questions, maybe you're having trouble finding an enumeration district or uh, just other questions come up, definitely uh, take advantage of that free service. And um, so thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback as we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings. Any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American ancestors to keep these programs free. And if you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org. Best of luck in your research, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.